two or three creatures like hares run out of the wood where I shot the fowl. I now began to consider that I might yet get a great many things out of the ship which would be useful to me, and particularly some of the riggings and sails, and such other things as might come to land, and I resolved to make another voyage on board the vessel, if possible. And as I knew that the first storm that blew must necessarily break her all in pieces, I resolved to set all other things apart till I had gotten everything out of the ship that I could get. Then I called a council, that is to say my thoughts, whether I should take back the raft, but this appeared impracticable. So I resolved to go as before, when the tide was down, and I did so, only that I stripped before I went from my hut, having nothing on but my checkered shirt, a pair of linen drawers, and a pair of pumps on my feet. I got on board the ship as before, and prepared a second raft, and having had experience of the first, I neither made this so unwildly nor loaded it so hard, but yet I brought away several things very useful to me. As first, in the carpenter's store, I found two or three bags full of nails and spikes, a great screw jack, a dozen or two of hatchets, and above all, the most useful thing called a grindstone. All these I secured, together with several things belonging to the gunner, particularly two or three iron crows and two barrels of musket bullets, seven muskets, another fowling piece, with some small quantity of powder more, a large bag full of small shot, and a great roll of sheet lead. But this last was so heavy I could not hoist it up to get it over the ship's side. Besides these things, I took all the men's clothes that I could find, and a spare foretopsail, a hammock, and some bedding, and with this I loaded my second raft and brought them all safe on shore to my very great comfort. I was under some apprehension during my absence from the land that at least my provisions might be devoured on shore, but when I came back I found no sign of any visitor, only there sat a creature like a wild cat upon one of the chests, which when I came towards it, ran away a little distance, and then stood still. She sat very composed and unconcerned, and looked full in my face, as if she had a mind to be acquainted with me. I presented my gun at her, but as she did not understand it, she was perfectly unconcerned at it, nor did she offer to stir away, upon which I tossed her a bit of biscuit, though, by the way, I was not very free of it, for my store was not great. However, I spared her a bit, I say, and she went to it, smelled at it, and ate it, and looked as if pleased for more. But I thanked her, and could spare no more, so she marched off. Having got my second cargo on shore, though I was fain to open the barrels of powder and bring them by parcels, for they were too heavy being large casks, I went to work to make me a little tent with the cell and some poles which I cut for that purpose. And into this tent I brought everything that I knew would spoil either with rain or sun, and I piled all the empty chest and cask up in a circle around the tent to fortify it from any sudden attempt, either from man or beast. When I had done this, I blocked up the door of the tent with some boards within, and an empty chest set up on end without, and spreading one of the beds upon the ground, laying my two pistols just at my head, and my gun at length by me, I went to bed for the first time, and slept very quietly all night, for I was very weary and heavy. For the night before, I had slept little, and had labored very hard all day to fetch all those things from the ship, and to get them on shore." I had the biggest magazine of all kinds now that ever was laid up, I believe, for one man. But I was not satisfied still, for while the ship sat upright in that posture, I thought I ought to get everything out of her that I could. So every day at low water I went on board and brought away something or other. But particularly the third time I went, I brought away as much of the rigging as I could as also all the small ropes and rope twine I could get, with a piece of spare canvas which was to mend the cells upon occasion, and the barrel of wet gunpowder. In a word, I brought away all the cells, first and last. 
only that I was fain to cut them in pieces and bring as much at a time as I could, for they were no more useful to be cells, but as mere canvas only. But that which comforted me more still was that last of all, after I had made five or six such voyages as these, and thought I had nothing more to expect from the ship that was worth my meddling with, I say, after all this, I found a great hogshead of bread, three large runlets of rum or spirits, a box of sugar, and a barrel of fine flour. This was surprising to me, because I had given over expecting any more provisions, except what was spoiled by the water. I soon emptied the hogshead of the bread, and wrapped it up, parcel by parcel, in pieces of the cell which I cut out, and, in a word, I got all this safe on shore also. The next day I made another voyage, and now, having plundered the ship of what was portable and fit to hand out, I began with the cables. Cutting the great cables into pieces, such as I could move, I got two cables and a hawser on shore, with all the ironwork I could get and having cut down the spirit cell yard and the mizzen yard and everything I could to make a large raft, I loaded it with all these heavy goods and came away. But my good luck began now to leave me, for this raft was so unwildly and so overladen that after I had entered the little cove where I had landed the rest of my goods, not being able to guide it so handily as I did the other, it overset and threw me and all my cargo into the water. As for myself, it was no great harm, for I was near the shore, but as to my cargo, it was a great part of it lost, especially the iron, which I expected would have been of great use to me. However, when the tide was out, I got most of the pieces of the cable ashore, and some of the iron, though with infinite labor, for I was fain to dip for it into the water, a work which fatigued me very much. After this, I went every day on board and brought away what I could get. I had been now thirteen days on shore and had been eleven times on board the ship, in which time I had brought away all that one pair of hands could well be supposed capable to bring. Though I believe verily, had the calm weather held, I should have brought away the whole ship piece by piece. But preparing the twelfth time to go on board, I found the wind began to rise. However, at low water, I went on board, and though I thought I had rummaged the cabin so effectually that nothing more could be found, yet I discovered a locker with drawers in it, in one of which I found two or three razors, and one pair of large scissors, with some tin or a dozen of good knives and forks. In another, I found about thirty-six pounds of value in money, some European coin, some Brazil, some pieces of eight, some gold, and some silver. I smiled to myself at the sight of this money. O oh, drug, said I aloud, what art thou good for? Thou art not worth to me. No, not the taking off the ground. One of those knives is worth all this heap. I have no manner of use for thee. And remain where thou art, and go to the bottom as a creature whose life is not worth saving. However, upon second thoughts, I took it away and wrapping all this in a piece of canvas, I began to think of making another raft, but while I was preparing this, I found the sky overcast, and the wind began to rise, and in a quarter of an hour it blew a fresh gale from the shore. It presently occurred to me that it was in vain to pretend to make a raft with the wind offshore, and that it was my business to be gone before the tide of flood began. Otherwise, I might not be able to reach the shore at all. Accordingly, I let myself down into the water and swam across the channel, which lay between the ship and the sand, and even that with difficulty enough, partly with the weight of the things I had about me, and partly the roughness of the water, for the wind rose very hastily, and before it was quite high water, it blew a storm. But I had got home to my little tent, where I lay, with all my wealth about me very secure. It blew very hard all night, and in the morning, when I looked out, behold, no more ship was to be seen. I was a little surprised, but recovered myself with the satisfactory reflection that I had lost no time, nor abated any diligence, 
to get everything out of her that could be useful to me, and that, indeed, there was little left in her that I was able to bring away, if I had more time. I now gave over any more thoughts of the ship, or of anything out of her, except what might drive on shore from her wreck, as, indeed, divers pieces of her afterwards did, but those things were of small use to me. My thoughts were now wholly employed about securing myself against either savages, if any should appear, or wild beasts, if any were in the island. And I had many thoughts of the method how to do this, and what kind of dwelling to make, whether I should make me a cave in the earth, or a tent upon the earth, and, in short, I resolved upon both, the manner and description of which it may not be improper to give an account of. I soon found the place I was in not fit for my settlement, because it was upon a low moorish ground near the sea, and I believed it would not be wholesome, and more particularly because there was no fresh water near it, so I resolved to find a more healthy and more convenient spot of ground. I consulted several things in my situation, which I found would be proper for me. First, health and fresh water I just now mentioned. Secondly, shelter from the heat of the sun. Thirdly, security from ravenous creatures, whether man or beast. Fourthly, a view to the sea, that if God sent any ship in sight, I might not lose any advantage for my deliverance, of which I was not willing to banish all my expectation yet. In search of a place proper for this, I found a little plain on the side of a rising hill, whose front towards this little plain was steep as a house side, so that nothing could come down upon me from the top. On the one side of the rock there was a hollow place, worn a little way in, like the entrance or door of a cave, but there was not really any cave or way into the rock at all. On the flat of the green, just before this hollow place, I resolved to pitch my tent. This plain was not above a hundred yards broad, and about twice as long, and lay like a green before my door, and at the end of it, descended irregularly every way down into the low ground by the seaside. It was on the north-northwest side of the hill, so that it was sheltered from the heat every day, till it came to a west and by south sun, or thereabouts, which, in those countries, is near the setting. Before I set up my tent, I drew a half-circle before the hollow place, which took in about ten yards in its semi-diameter from the rock and twenty yards in its diameter from its beginning and ending. In this half circle, I pitched two rows of strong stakes, driving them into the ground till they stood very firm like piles, the biggest end being out of the ground above five feet and a half, and sharpened on the top. The two rows did not stand above six inches from one another. Then I took the pieces of cable which I had cut in the ship and laid them in rows, one upon another, within the circle, between these two rows of stakes, up to the top, placing other stakes in the inside, leaning against them, about two feet and a half high, like a spur to a post, and this fence was so strong that neither man nor beast could get into it or over it. This cost me a great deal of time and labor, especially to cut the piles in the woods, bring them to the place, and drive them into the earth. The entrance into this place I made to be not by a door, but by a short ladder to go over the top, which ladder, when I was in, I lifted over after me, and so I was completely fenced in and fortified, as I thought, from all the world, and consequently slept secure in the night, which otherwise I could not have done, though, as it appeared afterwards, there was no need of all this caution from the enemies that I apprehended danger from. Into this fence or fortress, with infinite labor, I carried all my riches, all my provisions, ammunition, and stores, of which you have the account above, and I made a large tent, which to preserve me from the rains that in one part of the year are very violent there. I made double, one smaller tent within, and one larger tent above it, and covered the uppermost with a large tarp which I had saved among the cells. And now I lay no more for a while in the bed which I had brought on shore, but in a hammock, which was indeed a very good one, 
and belonged to the mate of the ship. Into this 